Hello and welcome into the KE Report. I'm your host, Shad Markwitz, and I'm speaking today with Alex Scanlon, CEO of Barton Gold, traded on the Australian exchange under the ticker BGD and on the OTCQB markets under the ticker BGDFF. And Barton Gold is a development stage company operating in South Australia with a couple projects under its belt, and it's a development stage company with a true pathway to production in the next couple of years because it also owns a fully permitted mill. And so, Alex, it's great to have you on the show to introduce this company. This is one of the companies that really caught my attention at the New Orleans Investment Conference just about a month back. We had a good conversation there, and I'd love you just to start things off by just sharing how this company came together. It's a relatively new company, and just walk us through the key projects that you have under your belt with Barton Gold. Hi, Shad. Thank you, firstly, for having us on. And second, it's a pleasure to be here. So yes, look, Barton Gold is a pure play gold developer in South Australia. And you've captured it really well. We are focused on South Australia. It's a state that actually contains about 25% of Australia's known gold resources. One of our projects is the largest undeveloped gold-only project in the state. So we've got kind of this anchor mineralization and we've actually consolidated a region there that's got about a 130-year history of high-grade gold production right in the center of the Gawler Creighton. So a lot, of t- a lot of your viewers will be familiar with BHP Billiton and the Olympic Dam Mine. Uh, there is an IOCG copper belt in the center of the state. That same basin, where it gets shallower to the west, hosts a gold belt, and we have consolidated pretty much every significant exploration and production asset there. So we have about 500,000 hectares or 1.25 million acres of properties. We own the only gold mill in the region. uh, And we have recently uh, grown our resources now past about 1.5 million ounces toward the plan that you identified, which was basically to turn these on in a staged lower cost, lower risk development methodology leveraging that existing mill and then continuing to extend that infrastructure, you know, monopoly in the region, if you will. Well, let's dive into the two projects that really we're going to be seeing most of the development work on and the lion's share of the exploration work. Let's start between the two with the higher grade deposit at Tarkula. This is really what's going to be moving into production first in the batting order as you truck ore from it up to the Gawler mill. So how did this deposit come together? What can you tell us about Tarkula? Yeah, so Tarkul is actually, it, it's interesting because it's actually the home of one gold in Australia, but really uh, high grade gold in South Australia. So at the same time as many other regions in the country and internationally were having their gold rushes, you, you, you know, obviously everybody's quite aware of the sort of the late 1800s gold rushes all over the world. In 1893, Tarkula was the site of South Australia's gold rush. So this is where, you know, the old timers came and they quite literally stumbled over gold sticking out of the ground. And this was developed into a high grade gold field during the early 1900s. Uh, about 70,000 ounces of gold was produced there by hand, just from shallow workings of uh, quartz hosted gold coming to surface in high grade veins. And the key thing there is the average grade of production was about 37 and a half grams per ton. So over one ounce per ton in these veins. When you fast forward about a hundred years, a mining lease was put in place. And from that mining lease, uh, a small open pit mine was opened around one of the historical mine shafts. And that's the Perseverance open pit. That produced about 50,000 ounces of gold. And that was putting ore up to and through our central Gawler mill during 2017 and 2018, running at about a 93 or 94% recovery. So this is the one where, as you say, you know, we've got this existing pit. We're actually looking at adding some high-grade mineralization onto that pit. Uh, but we're also now looking for repeats of that, of that high-grade open pit around this project area because we've just published about a month ago a regional architectural model, which is really the first time in 130 years we can see what all of the structures below surface look like. And so we now have something that we can sort of drill to, try to create a series of these high-grade open pits, and then feed that central Gawler mill as a stage one operation, which would be 
shallow, high grade, low cost, low risk, and hopefully very high profit because we aren't paying back a mill. Yeah, it's a nice ace in the hole to have that mill in place already. And you could truck the ore from multiple pits that you keep defining and finding at the Tarkula project. And as you say, this regional structural model you just completed really ties that all together. In a future interview, we'll dig into some of those individual targets and pits together, Alex. But let's also bring in how stage two would factor in from Tunkilia. And this is the larger project where you believe production could start at Tarkula, maybe around 50,000 ounces a year. But then you could have a step change where you bring it up to maybe 150,000 combined if you built a mill here at Tunkilia. And this is a big project, so it could really be a game changer for the company as the second stage of this. Walk us through the deposit and how it factors into the growth plan. Well, look, I think you actually captured much of the thesis there quite well. I mean, you know, if we can commence a stage one operation using Tarkula and the existing central Gullar mill, that obviously gives us a simple, low risk step into operations. But as we said, you know, the idea would then be that we can treat the Tonkilia project as an expansion project. And so for reference for your viewers, Tonkilia is located about 45 miles just to the south of Tarkula. So these are actually assets that are satellites to one another. They will work together eventually. We just have the advantage of being able to bring forward production at the northern Tarkula asset using the existing mill. But when we look at Tonkilia, The reason it's interesting is that it's not just close to Tarkula, but the geology is actually quite complementary. So Tarkula is shallow, narrower, higher grade things. Uh, Tonkilia is big, broad, kilometers wide shear zone where you are looking at big bulk open pit operations. And so this is where we have a deposit, I used to say sort of a cornerstone deposit there called the 223 deposit. This deposit was found back in 1996 the vast majority of historical work and drilling before our ownership was done on this asset when the US dollar gold price was probably averaging below $400 an ounce. So we got into the data, we recognized that there was probably one, not only significant growth potential in that cornerstone asset, but two, the potential to find multiple repeats of that mineralization around it. And now in the past three years, we've actually grown this deposit three times. So we grew it from about 550 or 560,000 ounces in early 2020 when we acquired control to about 965,000 ounces in October 2020. Earlier this year in April, we grew it to 1.15 million ounces. And then just two weeks ago, on the 11th of December, we announced an upgrade to 1.38 million ounces, almost 1.4 million ounces. And that's come about through not only the extensions of the main deposit, but the identification of multiple new gold zones around that main deposit and then converting some of those into Jork Resource. So it's an asset that we think was overlooked for a long time. uh, And we're obviously quite pleased with its growth trajectory. And and we actually have another 4,000 meters of drilling outstanding on another regional target around it that we think may be able to convert into Jork Resource as early as March. So we're really marching it along, really stepping it along in terms of its growth. And that's an asset that we see becoming really a multi-million ounce platform to underwrite this 150,000 ounce per annum production target as an expansion of operations, as opposed to one big giant leap into uh, operations. Well, as you mentioned, the ability that your team has had to add significantly to the ounces in place in the resource, as you say, now 1.38 million ounces, but growing and still drilling. Talk to us a little bit about the expiration upside at both projects. Uh, You had a really low cost per ounce as far as the discovery cost, but just in both cases, what is the blue sky upside on the expiration side that the team is working on in the year to come? Yeah, look, you know, with both of these assets, we're really just scratching the surface. And I know it's easy to say that, but We tend to be a very sort of methodically driven team in terms of how we use sometimes new technologies and existing technologies to really build up a platform, build up a strategy and a thesis, and then go out and systematically test this. So with Tarkula, that new regional model that we've published about a month ago that says, hey, here's how all of the controlling structures actually sit in place 
here's how the known high grade gold sits within these structures. That's the first time in 130 years that anyone's been able to actually develop and publish that. So we are looking really starting from that existing high grade Petit Tarkula. Now we have a whole buffet of targets to go and hit for potential repeats of that high grade open pit. And then when we look at Tunkilia, again, down on this big sheer deposit, we've really been playing in a relatively small sandbox. So we've been playing around the baseline footprint of that main deposit. We've almost tripled resources from about 500,000 ounces to 1.4 million ounces. We've done that really selectively testing our targets and then, and then quite efficiently testing them. So the growth that we've had there during 2023 alone has been about 413,000 ounces and the all-in cost of discovering those ounces has been less than $10 US per ounce. So very, very efficient. But now we're actually starting to step out of this sort of known sandbox. And that's really only about, I would say, 15% of the shear zone. So we've got another 85% of that shear in terms of our tenement coverage that is under investigated, untouched, and our modeling indicates that it will host repeats of this style of mineralization. We've actually just drilled 4,000 meters in one such target just down the shear zone to test that. And if that comes back mineralized with gold, uh, and we'll get these results, we think, uh, hopefully in, in early February, if that comes back, we've really opened up the door to the next several kilometers of the shear zone. And that could be a real sort of step change or game changer for this project on its own. Well, we'll keep following along as you put out more exploration news and get you back on the show to kind of recap key milestones as the team continues to drill and expand these resources at both projects. But let's talk a little bit about the team, Alex, just because there's a rich history here in Australia of majors operating in the area and you've acquired some of the team members and built a solid team of people that have been there and done that not just on the exploration side but on the mine development and build side so walk us through the pedigree of the team yeah look we really focus on team as one of the most important things and I, and I, again that's easy to say and, and harder to do so barton gold was actually born out of a a sort of multi-family office investment vehicle that i was running and one of the key criteria for us was always team. Uh, and, you know, we'd look at anything we invested in, it was about team, team, team. And then you'd look at the assets and the jurisdictions, and then you're back to team, team, and team again. So we've really focused on building a team that reflects not a present driller developer, but really our forward ambition to be a, you know, an emerging junior mid-tier producer. And so... To put this in a frame of reference, today everyone is talking now about Newmont buying Newcrest. 22 years ago, everybody was talking about Newmont first entering Australia by buying Normandy Mining. So amongst our leadership team, about half of our senior leadership team are formerly of Normandy Mining and Newmont. And so in 2002, Normandy Mining was Australia's largest gold producer, and so producing about 2 million ounces per annum. And so we really have that sort of rich expertise in our team. You know, our chair was the CFO of that. We have uh, one of their former chief surveyors and technical services supervisors. We have one of their former exploration geologists. And then the balance of the team are some of the most, you know, sort of recognized gold and copper exploration geologists in South Australia. We have somebody who specializes in building and optimizing mills. Uh, and we also have somebody, you know, even on the corporate governance front, we have the former general counsel for Santos Limited, which is a multi-billion dollar South Australian oil and gas producer. So we've really built that holistic team and capability where we've got over 200 years of experience exploring for permitting, financing, building, operating, and optimizing major assets with a particularly strong pedigree in gold and a particularly strong pedigree in South Australia. Well, Alex, let's also look at who some of the key stakeholders are in the company. Give us a quick financial snapshot of Barton Gold. What's the share structure look like? How are you doing as far as money in the bank? And then, yeah, who are some of these key stakeholders that are backing the company? 
Yeah, so we have a pretty simple capital structure. We have about 195 million shares on issue. So at around a 25 Australian cent share price, that makes us around a $50 million company. At the current exchange rate, you know, we're probably around sort of 16, 17 cents US and maybe around a, you know, 35 million US, uh, 30 to 35 million US company. As of the 30th of September, we had about $13 million worth of cash and gold in concentrates. Now, one of our unique features is that we do actually actively monetize our assets. So we are on track to generate around $10 million in additional non-dilutive capital during the past sort of 24 months. So that's allowed us to basically move forward with very low dilution. We've only done one capital raise since our IPO this past June. And that was really responsive to our our second most recent uh, resource upgrade for Tonkilia. And at that point, what we saw was quite a few new institutional investors coming to us and saying, look, we have been following you. We've been you know, watching the really careful, you know, efficient expenditure of capital, the diligent growth, you know, really careful capital management and these asset monetization initiatives. And so you know, we'd like to join you guys on the journey if you can open a raise for us. So we did a small raise in June. And what that's done in terms of the, the sort of key supporters for the company is we have sort of four quarters, if you will, of our shareholder pie. Board and management uh, speak for about uh, one quarter of the company. So very, very strong alignment between board and management and the balance of shareholders. Institutional and corporate shareholders speak for another quarter of the company approximately. Basically, these groups are all specialist gold and resource development groups. So this is Merck out of the US, Ixios out of France, Argonaut and Collins Street uh, gold funds out of Australia, Ballingall Investment Advisors out of Hong Kong, uh, and Mercer Street as well out of the US. And then when you look at the the balance of our shareholding, we have a very significant representation of sort of high net wealth and family offices who while they may not be considered institutional, have a very strong history in resource investment and development. So really, in terms of our general retail component, that's also about a quarter. But board, institutional, and sort of family office, you've got about 75% ownership of the company. So it's a very strong base. We've seen our retail register growing considerably on market. We've seen these institutions buying and building on market. And it's really putting us in a in a, a considerably stronger position than many in the gold sector to really spring forward as sentiment returns. And we've seen this in our share price. You know, over the past year or so, uh, we've outperformed the Vanek index and the gold price and our index of our peers by anywhere between sort of fifty and ninety percent. Uh, so that recognition is coming into the work that we're doing, and hopefully. We will be able to continue that pace going into 2024. Well, Alex, we are definitely going to follow along in 2024 with some of the key news as it breaks, be it expiration or development in nature. And this was fun to introduce Barton Gold and get an overview of the company. If people liked getting information on this, definitely click on the link below. It takes you over to the company's website to the news section where you can follow along with the news. And Alex, as more news comes out in the new year, Keep us posted. We'll get you back on the show and we'll get a little more granular in some of the projects and some of the key targets the team is working on. And looking forward to talking to you again in the new year. Likewise. Thank you very much.